Cool. Okay, the bundler. So I think it makes sense, I think this will all make sense if you understand why I wanted to give this talk. And why, why I wanted to give this talk? talk, excuse me. Why do you want to give this talk? I'm about to get that. Who are you? That's in there. <laughs> Alright, cool. Um, so the reason I wanted to give this talk was um, I was at LSRC, Lone Star Ruby Conference, and Greg Pollock was up there and he was talking about deciphering Yehuda. And one of, <clears throat> one of the things he talked about was the bundler. And the bundler doing depth first search and backtracking to resolve its dependencies. Now, who here has heard, of, heard those words before? Alright, cool. Um, so my, you know, flags went up and I was like, oh my god, I haven't heard that since grad school. And so immediately started looking into what the bundler was, what it was doing, and um, I found a lot of cool stuff. So I called this talk Bundler, the easy, the hard, and the NP complete. Um, and I was really kind of stretching to have these three categories, but the hard isn't really that hard. So the other title is the bundler, don't shoot the messenger. And why don't shoot the messenger? Um, in essence, the bundler really is there to help you with a very simple question, which is would you rather have your app fail because of its dependencies during runtime or before you get a chance to run it? And that is the big thing the bundler is doing for us. So who am I really quick? Chris Pathananza, uh, GitHub handle, Twitter handle. I think of myself as a jack of all trades and a master of one. I do have my master's in computer science. Um, <laughs> I like to make things, and I'm from New Jersey, so that will explain the coarser bits of my personality as you get to know me better. Um, anyways, back to the bundler. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you, Google Image Search. Now, the idea here is, remember, the bundler is going to um, change your Ruby environment. It's going to surround your code with itself, and it's going to make you feel happy. It's going to let you play patty cake. It's going to let you do some Russian dancing, I'm not sure. but. <laughs> this is how you should feel when you're using the bundler. And if you don't feel like this, something is wrong. So, maybe, no, 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 this is the bundler we're talking about. Okay, that's right. No, this, this is a pretty cool, uh, it's the sleeper gift of the season for men and women. It predates the uh, Snuggie. All right, so the easy part of what the bundler is doing is it installs your gems, all right? <coughs> cool, we're done. Um, the harder things it's doing is it's using the bundler gems instead of your system gems. So this is using Bundler outside of Rails. And finally, there's some NP-complete stuff going on with constraint satisfaction, right? Now, this is not a fun graph to manage by hand. Um, and that's why, we, that's essentially um, the dependency resolution, and this is the, the graph it's traversing. So we'll see more about that uh, later. <laughs> And once again, don't shoot the messenger, right? So Bundler's going to fail when something is screwed up in this graph. And that's better than you having to manage it by hand. So um, we're a little, you know, kind of going to try to condense some of this stuff because there are a lot of slides here. So let's kind of go through the easy part. So the easy stuff is the gem file, the gem file.lock, and the command line interface. The gem file is a common Ruby thing we see, um, idiom if you will, like rake files or Blake files. Um, it's a DSL for specifying dependencies and evaluated as Ruby code. So that gem file basically works by you know, providing methods um, that will then get eval when the gem file gets read in. So what can you put in your gem file? You can put sources. Uh, these go at the top of the gem file, one declaration per source. Most of us are going to use gem cutter or Ruby gems, but um, this kind of came up with debugging uh, one of Bundler's um, spec tasks, and so you can actually point it to your file system. Something you might want to know. And one thing I want to mention is that I really, really wanted to get everything in here, and it's not possible. There's a lot going on with this library, so there is a manual, and I would love to direct people to it. Um, but I think it's good to kind of be exhaustive and go through um, at least all the high level stuff. So, declaring a gem, very simple. Uh, version operators. So, uh, does anyone know the name of this operator? Squ Me either. Squiggly. 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 Tilda. Tilda. I call it the sperm operator. operator. Um, <laughs> 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 but basically, what it's going to do is it's going to constrain your version, um, and and this is actually really neat and, and and awesome for what you're doing. So, basically, this is like saying 2.1.x or uh, more you know, mathy way to think of it is expanding it into greater than or equal to um, 2.1.0 and less than 2.2. .2. 
So what this is going to do is it's going to keep you on a major or minor revision, and when you go to update your gems, not replace Rails 2 with Rails 3 and ruin your day. Um, Yehuda also wrote a post called Greater Than or Equal To is Considered Harmful, where he goes into big um, detail of why this operator is important and why you should be using it in the bundle. You can use the require statement in your gem file, which we've all seen. If the gem has one name and it has to get required as something else. Um, groups, people who have use Rails also use this on the daily, um, but in the block format. And those are significant when you're outside of Rails if you want to require a different environment. So this is how you do that. Um, you make a call to bundler.setup, bundler or you can require bundler.setup. Um, this will require the default environment. This is going to require the test and default environment. Um, and then require is going to actually require those gems. So this is just um, setting up the environment to allow you to require those gems, and this is what's going to pull them in by hand. Uh, the recommendation is to do this only uh, once doing it by hand gets annoying. So, you know, around your third to fifth gem is a loose ballpark. Also, Rails 3, ironically enough, has to do the same thing to get the bundler up and going. So here's in config.boot, there's your call to bundler.setup, and then in config application RB, here's your call to default, and rails.env. And that's how, you know, production gets required or test gets required at the appropriate time. Like magic. You can also do stuff um, with platforms, which is useful for those of us that are not on Matt's Ruby interpreter. Um, so I know I don't know exactly some libraries. I mean, I wanted to say sockets, but does JRuby handle sockets out of the box? Anyone? Okay, um, but you know there are libraries that are different in JRuby, or that you um, might want to specify only per platform. What's really cool about the git option is this was basically designed so you could be working with a gem, decide you need to fix it, put it up on GitHub, and pull it into your code. Um, so what git's going to do is it's going to use the gem spec as intended. This is a reference to another blog post by Yehuda Katz. Um, basically, the git option is going to read the gem spec to figure out what's going on in your gem. And so that's why it's in the gem spec that it cannot have dependencies outside of itself. These are both from the documentation. So it's going to use gem build to build your gem. And does anyone spot the error with that? Anyone? On Git, Rails is at version 3. I specified version 2.3.8. That would cause a resolve fail. So what's cool about um, Git repos is they're going to take part in um, resolution just like any other gem. And finally, uh, you can specify that a gem lives at a path, and then this isn't going to compile the native extensions. Um, I looked into why. It's on line 395 in lib uh, bummer source. Yehuda explains why this is basically um, it's a pain in the butt. And the idea is if it's already on your system, they're not going to go through the hassle of recompiling it. Uh, I'll defer to the source for any more information there. And the idea here is we scratch the surface. Anything you kind of want to do, you can probably do in that file. So um, that's where that documentation comes in. So gemfile.lock. Now this is your right, evil twin for ruining your day. Everyone hates the lock file, hates on the lock file. We don't want to get rid of lock file, but why? No. So the lock file is a snapshot of the gem versions in current use resolved from the gem file. So here's an example. Now, in these sections, <coughs> the specs, these are all your gems with their dependencies. The platforms are the platforms that you've uh, designated. There's a section I don't have here for sources. Um, and then the dependencies, this is going to be, this is actually the straight list of all the gems that you put in your gem file. So they're going to show up here as a straight list. And we'll, we'll talk about why. So what is this really? It's got your sources sections. We saw the gem section, platforms, and dependencies. Um, and what it is is it's more information than your gem file. So in our gem file, we're dry. We're lazy, right? We don't want to repeat ourselves. We just say, give me Rails. But Rails has all this other stuff in it. And so the gem file, or the gem file.lock, rather, is all the work that Bundler did um, to pick the dependencies of dependencies of dependencies and put them in one file. So all this stuff is the stuff we were too lazy and kind of didn't feel like specifying in our gem file. And once again, why should we when we have programs like this? It's not YAML. Um, there's a lock file parser that parses all different parts of those sections. So the gem file is your dry input, and the lock 
makes your application a single package of both your code and the third party co code that, well you guys can read. <laughs> so, and that's important because Rails requires action mail, which requires action pack, which requires both active support and rack. And you have to manage all of those little dependencies um, by hand uh, if, if this wasn't done for you. So what are some other approaches, right? If, if we don't like the gem file.lock, what else would you do? Um, you can keep the gems right next to the code, but if you send that to somebody else's computer, you might have a problem with native extensions. And what are you going to do when gems get upgraded? You're going to probably manage all that by hand. Works in the small scale, but that really does, that's, that's not web scale. Um, <laughs> So some other approaches, you could, you could keep a list of gems and you know, iterate over it, but version changes might cut you up, cut you up, catch you up, <laughs> cut you too. Um, dependencies, and once again, the future, things are gonna change in the future. They, you know, a gem might require uh, active support on one day, and then someone might say, you know what, I'm sick of requiring active support because that's not cool anymore, so I'm gonna you know, not require that, and, that's a kind of small example, but you know things change over time, and we have to uh, deal with that. And once again, this is the mess just to get Rails. This is just requiring Rails. This is everything that, that happens when you require Rails. Okay. So that's we're still in the easy section. We're gonna kind of blow through these. Um, oh, they're not around time, so we don't have to blow through these. But install, update, package, exec, and config are your primary commands um, for the bundle. And then check, list, show, console, open, viz, and init. And if Terrence has his way, there's going to be clean in here too. Um, and bundle gem. So what do these do? So install, it's going to install the gem specified by the gem file or gem file.lock. And uh, this also works when you um, just call bundle. This is what gets run when you, when you type bundle. Um, you can do some, you can give some flags like without production. This one I just learned today, but bundle will actually remember you said this. Um, so you can say, you know, install my gems, but don't put the production gems there if you're on a test machine or vice versa. Um, though deployment is actually um, better for doing, you know, a real deploy. So you wouldn't want to say without test, without development. You'd actually want to do deployment because this is going to do, this is going to change more settings than just, uh, just which gems are required. Deployment is actually going to, um, install the gems to vendor bundle instead of your system. And, which is what I did not mention, which is uh, by default this is gonna get installed to your system. Um, but bundle install is just gonna install them to your system and it's set up and require that actually pull them in. So, um, I wanted to go through some of this, uh, the high level, like when resolution gets invoked uh, during install. And I like to do that um, via explaining how the source code works. So there's an installer class, and that inherits from environment. And environment's a big player in the bundler source code. Um, it calls installer.run, and then there's a lot of indirect directions. That calls self specs, and environment proxies to definition specs, which is what our environment was doing. Um, and then finally, that call to specs is going to make a resolution happen. And that might not have seemed um, clear, so, so this is what's going on. So you, you start your app. Here's our call to installer.run. Right? That's going to call a bunch of stuff. One of those I promised was specs, which was proxy by the environment to definition. <laughs> That's going to go up to the resolver. And then finally, we'll come down here, follow this, following this line, in case you weren't playing that at home, but we're following this line. And bam. Well, the resolve, resolver.start. Now, this is actually looking at what these call graphs do is great because object. What the heck? Catch? We'll come back to that later. But right now, here's the resolution happening. Well, resolver.resolve. Lots of calls between resolve, catch right here. Cool. So, yeah. So, originally, you know, you think, oh, yeah, bundler. This is one little, I just type bundle and it goes. I could, I could write that. Yeah. Okay. Bundle update. So this is going to update dependence. Uh, if you do it without um, anything, it's going to update dependencies to their latest versions. Gem name is going to ins in, in, uh, update just the one gem. Um, package is going to put the gem files into vendor cache. And so this will actually, and then when you do install 
Um, you can install from the cache. So the package and install work together, especially um, install with the deployment flag. Um, exec is one of my favorites. I don't know why. I guess it's because I didn't realize it at first. Um, but you can do uh, exec rspec and cucumber. So these are going to run all the, the binaries that were installed by bundle. Um, if you run cucumber at the top level and don't put bundle exec in front of it, you're going to be running your system's cucumber, not the one that's installed via bundler. Um, that might not be entirely true for Rails because you know if Rails boot gets called, then it's going to execute that code that was in there. But you know, for those of us that have written Ruby outside of Rails, important. Um, so config stores uh, key values. Um, the big one that's used is to set some C flags for the MySQL uh, compile process. Nevertheless, you can rename what your default gem file is going to be. Um, and this is really just an arbitrary key value store. So I set thing to setting, and lo and behold, bundle thing was stored as setting. And this was stored in um, my OK. Uh, then there's the utility command. So you have bundle check, which is just going to run the resolver and say, hey, you know, uh, things are looking good or, or you're screwed, but not actually do an install so you can make a decision yourself or see what changed. Um, bundle list lists all the gems. Show is, um, I guess, you know, I like show better than exec, to be honest. Um, so this is going to show you where. Um, the location of a gem is installed, which is useful for A, debugging the install process to make sure you put the gems you wanted to, but really B is um, getting to the source of your gem. So a gem fails, you want to know where it is, uh, bundle show is what's going to give you that. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll CD bundle show to a directory and then start grabbing from it to find, you know, just the function calls I'm looking for or what went wrong. Um, if you want to wind up in an editor, you can just use bundle open. And that's going to open the gem in your favorite command line editor. It's basically equivalent for me, typing vim, bundle show, if you don't use vim, or whatever. Um, I'm sure it executes from the command line, so you could do that too. Um, it's going to look at environment variables, um, bundler editor, visual, and then editor. Um, console's cool if you're outside of Rails. It's like your script console. Um, and then viz is really awesome. So this is going to create a visual representation of dependencies. All these graphs I've had in here are courtesy of the bundle viz command. Um, yeah, I didn't sit there and make them. Um, so pretty useful. Init and then gem, these are for starting up. Um, this is going to just you know make a gem file and stick it in your directory. And then gem is actually going to create the directory structure if you're developing a gem which um, Yehuda makes a lot more assumptions. And it's not just Yehuda, uh, Carl Huda, actually. But we can get into that at the end. Um, so this is what's in the directory after I run test gem. You get a gem file, lib, rig file, a gem spec. Inside the library is the name of your library with the top level Ruby folder. And then inside of here is version.rb. But I wasn't going to type that out. OK, so that was the easy stuff. Um, now we're going to get into what's actually going on and how the bundler is fighting the system gems. So we do these little uh, require statements here, and they do a lot of work for us. So I figured if we just looked at these two methods in some good detail, we'd have a way better understanding of what the bundler is doing uh, to our system. There's a class self. So these are top level. You know, This is bundler.setup. This is the setup from lib bundler. Um, but come on. Anyways, so it makes a call to load.setup. Right? And then setup, load.setup is actually going to create a runtime.new. The runtime, I can just tell that this actually is probably going to inherit from environment because environment takes the root and definition. If you remember the definition specs is what, what got called to do the resolve. Um, here's the definition. A lot of these are just methods. So definition.build um, with your gem file and lake file, or lake file, rig file. Um, is going to actually make the satisfaction happen. So definition.build, it's going to lead to a call of dsl.new, it's going to call dsl.toDefinition, it's going to call definition.new. And what is definition.new? So this is how the resolution is going to happen at setup time. Uh, these are from the source too. So it's going to load information from the gem file and the lock file. Now remember, things could have changed between the gem file and the lock file. Uh, so it invalidates the stale locked specs 
which are ones that changed in the lot file. Um, and then any specs from a stale spec themselves are stale, stale, stale. And then all specs that are reachable through a stale dependency are also stale. So this is just what does stale mean? And then do a resolve with the stale uh, dependencies not included. Cool. So let's see setup and action. So remember, we can pass in our groups to set up. So first thing setup's going to do is clean the load path. Um, this is going to take your dollar sign load path variable from whatever was in it to basically nothing. If you remember, Ruby loads um, um, Ruby loads files by looking at what's in the load path, and that's just a global variable that you can manipulate. And we'll see that um, all of what you're going to see until end is just the setup method. So I kind of broke it up into multiple slides so we can go through the little bits. Here we're going to get a resolve uh, to specs. Now this is not the specs method, this is a variable. But to no one's surprised that definition has more than one method to pull in your spec. So it has specs for a group, and then requested specs is going to um, default to another set of specs. But this basically line is going to trigger the resolve. As you saw with the call graph, it would take a long time to build up all the different calls and understanding to actually um, really walk through it like I'd like to. Um, set up ENVs, that's going to just set up ENV variables, cripple Ruby gems. Now this is another kind of interesting thing that the bundler is doing, and this is the line where bundler fights your system. So what happens in cripple Ruby gems is that Ruby gems overrides the require method of kernel, right? That's a common Ruby um, idiom to you know add advanced functionality to the whole system is you know overriding one of these big important methods. Um, what the bundler's going to do is it's actually going to use the same technique of aliasing the method names to undo the alias that RubyGems does and basically um, use normal kernel require and stick its own gem method in. And basically the gem method becomes the semantics. Um, well, bundler.require, you know, gem and bundler.require basically become your mechanism of requiring um, code. Now here, in the method. Okay, so now we've got our specs. Now we're just going to iterate over them and essentially we're going to reject duplicates and we're just going to add them to the load path. So, you know, this was the hard section and I realized it's not that hard, but this is your global load path. So this is, this is the bundler. You know, bundler.setup is setting up your load path and adding these gems to your load path. Okay. Now, when you call require, I actually didn't realize this until I went to the source, but it turns out require itself calls setup first. Um, and I was a little dubious on that, so I ran two test files and kind of um, S-traced them, and the only difference between the two of them was four lines, and I'm believing that was the four lines where um, you don't see this, but load that load.setup call is going to get memoized and then returned if it already exists. So setup groups is going to call setup if you haven't, and then it's going to call bundler top level require. Excuse me. Um, so require is going to go through your groups, it's going to turn them all to symbols, or it's going to create um, just this is how it does you know default if you haven't set any. Um, it's going to run through all of your dependencies and skipping the ones that aren't in the group, and then actually calling kernel.require on the ones that it does. <coughs> So, and then if kernel.require doesn't work, it's going to do a little bit more to try to order require. So, once again, we can kind of walk through all this stuff um, at the top level. So, require, call setup. Now, I didn't already call setup here. Here's bundler.load. Here's our call to specs again. But if you notice, the resolve is a little bit different this time. <coughs> And this is because we already installed everything. So the gemfile.lock should have the information if you know you haven't been screwing around with stuff and messing with your gem file, right? So all the so the the resolution actually just kind of takes place here. You notice there's no call to object.catch, um, some of our favorite methods are not there. And then it's gonna do a lot more stuff, ignoring that, coming back up to bundle require, and then whoa, whoa. There we go. Everybody gets invited to the party. Cool. 
So now we've seen bundle.setup and bundle.require do their thing. Nice. Okay. So now we actually get to more of the fun stuff, at least for me, the MP complete bit. Um, and that's constraint satisfaction. So what is constraint satisfaction? Finding a solution to a set of constraints. Wonderful circular definition. Great. But, I mean, we kind of already know where this is going, right? By the constraints, that's our gem file. And then by the solution, that's, that's what the gem file dot lock is. Um, now, if constraint satisfaction and gem files and all this stuff is a little much, let's just forget about gems, talk about queens. Oh! <laughs> this is Aaron Patterson. I don't know if you guys recognize him. But uh, he gave a talk at Gogoruko about, and uh, I, this is actually one of his slides. Um, but no, I don't mean that queen. I mean the end queen's problem. And all respect to Aaron. He's way better than all of you. But anyways, so um, what we're going to talk about is the end queen's problem, and because it's kind of the academic example of constraint satisfaction. So the end queen's problem is actually pretty, um, pretty simple to explain, right? So you're given so. What's n? So given an n, n is kind of the, you know, how big this is going to get. So given an n by n chessboard, place n queens on that chessboard so that none of them can attack each other. Now sometimes I describe this to people and they're like, oh, that's impossible. Well, they're right for n 1, 2, and 3, but as soon as n is size 4 or bigger, you can solve this. So quick run over this, make sure none of these queens can attack each other, right? No diagonal business. Good. Cool. So how are we going to solve that, right? Like, it's, I don't know. Maybe we should just put a bunch of dots and put queens on the dots. Yeah, yeah that's pretty easy. We'll just brute force it. Cool. All right. Yeah. We'll just keep generating solutions, check if it's solution, and if not, generate the next one, right? Um, and before we do, actually, let's get, let's get pretty clever on what our solution is. So the solution for n equals 10 looks like this. It did not look like dots and cues, but it's actually an array. Um, and the index is the row, the value corresponds to the column. Um, so this is actually some, some code that I was able to pull up uh, back from my grad school days because I did all of my grad school projects in Ruby after a certain, certain point. Um, so I put this stuff up on GitHub about the end queens problem, but I figured it'd be cool to kind of have an end queen solver that was uh, kind of done in a BD, BDD style. We didn't, we didn't do much of that in grad school. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve the end queens problem with exhaustive search. So in order to correctly solve the end queens problem, as Chris, the brute, brute force coder, I need to satisfy the problem constraints with exhaustive search. So solving for n equals 4, right? There should be one queen per row, one queen per column, one queen per diagonal. Um, same thing for n equals 10. And I'm starting to notice uh, kind of a pattern here. So there's our cubes. And whoop, whoa, where am I going? N queens. OK, cool. All right, so let's actually break out. Uh, is this going to work? I was hoping to, you know, hoping, yeah, the whole table today. Just bring the laptop any closer. Okay. Cool. So now we're going to get off the full screen here. We're going to switch over to the command line. This is not easy. <coughs> cool. We're going to go to the end queens project. Cute, right? So that's my little uh, bash alias for bundle exec cucumber. Is who likes typing. So here we are. So all right, everyone's satisfied that this works. Cool. So let's look at um, let's look at some of the code for exhaustive search because it's actually surprisingly simple. All right, so that's it. Um, and that, that passed those specs. All right, so here's the exhaustive module. Um, 
you know, and this this code's a little old, so I actually this kind of warmed my heart when I saw it. Um, but anyways, um, so here we are, just running it from the command line. Um, so there's a solve function and a queen check. So this is the meat of our exhaustive search right here. Um, zero dot 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 n to array. So we're getting, we're taking a range that's from size zero to the size of how many queens we're looking up. We're turning that to an array, and we're calling the permutation method. The permutation method is really cool. I don't care what anyone says about it. Before, I had to do this combinatorial.perm stuff, and I was pulling in this combinatorial class that I didn't write. But in Ruby 1.8.7 and above, uh, array gets a permutation and a combination method, and those do what you would think, um, which is create every different combination or permutation. The difference between a permutation and a combination is that order matters in a permutation. So here we want permutations because there's a difference between 0, 1, 2 and 0, 2, 1. They're actually two different board configurations. Um, so we have to go through permutations and that's going to be a pain as we'll find out um, in a few seconds. But so basically, so it's going to go through every permutation of an array that is the size of the board, so that's good. Um, and then it's just going to return an answer if uh, it matches the queen check. Um, oh man. So I didn't, I didn't make my latest push, but I kind of cleaned this up. Because, um, you know, th these are kind of x1 and x, this is x1 and y1, and this is kind of y, or yeah, x1, y1, y2, x2, y2. Um, but basically, this is going to go through the array, it's a nested loop, and it's just going to check the diagonals. Um, and it turns out that if, there's, if the queens are fine on the diagonals, they're also fine on the rows and the columns. It's kind of domain specific knowledge that doesn't um, really matter to anyone, right? So here's your queen check algorithm. Uh, simple, easy, and um, there's one more thing about it. It's, uh, it's freaking slow. So we want to run Ruby Exhaustive RB with, all right, size 10. Oh, that wasn't too bad. I'm not being fair to this. Yeah. All right, what are you doing? Come on. All right, that took a little while. Hmm. All right, I'm impatient already. Yeah. So, uh, what's, what's, what's going on? Well, actually, all right, so the long and the short of that is I don't need to compute it, but basically, um, by the, uh, this grows exponentially. So by the time you're doing exhaustive with um, 10, you've already, um, you're already looking at 3 million examples, I think. And it just gets uh, orders of magnitude um, or is the magnitude slower from there? Wow, oh, that's what I wanted. So time, so basically the reason um, that's so slow is time is not on your side. So I started timing Ruby, Ruby exhaustive search with 15 and I gave up after 656 minutes. Because, I don't know, it's, it's over 10 hours there. It's, it's a long time. <laughs> so what are we going to do? I mean, we could just you know, pack it up and go home at this point, but some of these uh, <coughs> problems are kind of interesting, and we kind of want the answer to them. Maybe not the end Queens one, but maybe that jump file stuff. So the first thing to say, you know, what should we do, is to realize what we're doing. And we're searching, right? We were searching through all the permutations. And I had a professor who always like to say, AI is search. Well, here, search is AI. Um, and at the top level, we'll say there's two ways to search a tree, right? Breath first search, death first search. Okay, there's two ways to search a tree. Breath first search and death first search. But of course that's a lie because there's an infinite number of ways to go through a tree. There's as, as many ways to go through a tree as there are trees, right? If not more. So it's not really true to say breath first search and death first search are the only two ways to search a tree, but they're very useful to start. Um, so breath first search <laughs> corresponds to opening all the nodes of a search tree um, at one level and then opening up all the next nodes. 
So basically, you look at all the children of root one, of one before you start looking at five. And in depth first search, you search down to the bottom of the tree before you open up um, nodes, or nodes on an equal level. And as you can, I guess, kind of figure out that these are really the only two options when you're at a given node, right? Do I want to go across, or do I want to go down? Um, <coughs> But what we saw with that is those trees get really big. I mean, you know, with, with size n of 10, we're already looking at 3 million examples. So what if we want to do better than that? Well, at first, let's introduce some new terms. There's the searchable space, the potential, potential search tree, which is what happened when we had the brute force solution. Um, and then there's the searched space, what actually gets searched. Um, in the brute force case, these are the same thing. And I wanted to use other terms here, but part of the problem is there isn't consist they're, they're not consistent, so they're not worth putting up on the slide. I've seen this called um, the solution space and this called the search space. That's what I'm kind of used to referring to them as. Uh, however, I've seen this called the problem space and this called the solution space, which is awesome because they use the solution in two contexts, which means you can't have a conversation about this without saying, hey, wait, which, which one of those two are you talking about? But you get the idea. There's a brute force way to do this, and then there's a better than brute force way. And my, this is my stuff, so AI is what happens when you do better than brute force, right? When you actually incorporate some sort of technique to not look at all the examples. And one of those techniques is backtracking. Backtracking is really just the next step up from brute force search in a way. Because what's happening in that permutations algorithm is a recur, you know, I've, uh, that's actually in Ruby, um, it's in array.c in 187 and above, and it's a recursive call to generate all of the um, examples. So the problem was that we were checking if the solution was correct after it was generated. So why don't we get in during that um, generation process, and, bef and as soon as we know something's going to be a bum path, stop looking down at it, right? If you've got two queens that are on a diagonal, I mean, you can put however else many queens on the board, but if those two queens can attack each other, you've failed the constraint. Um, and that's, that's really what backtracking does. So <clears throat> it's the same idea. It's a recursive algorithm, but the big difference between backtracking and brute force search is this line right here. Because it's going to say, if you're not a good solution, return. Don't keep going. If you're the right solution, I'm done. Right? So get out of here. Otherwise, essentially this, and this is from Wikipedia, in case someone wants to know. Um, this is basically pulling, you know, this is the academic way of saying, you know, keep the problem space around, pull the first, and then just keep iterating while there's children. So this is, this is your general backtracking algorithm. Um, also not terribly complex. So let's take a look at that in its end queens form. Um, backtrack. So the backtracking class, I mean, I'll just show you that really quick. That's just kind of a wrapper for this. So it's just gonna say solve. Um, but all the meat is happening in backtrack. Okay. So this is a really actually cool code example. I didn't write this. Um, I found this like two years ago and then have reappropriated it for the talk, which is the same thing as finding it. Um, but basically, um, what's cool here is this is using each to do the recursion, and here's your, if, if it succeeds, you know, yield the answer and get out of here. Otherwise, keep running through the tree. But the first most important thing you must do is prune the bad examples. And you can see the rest of this is really just stack management, you know, push it on the stack, keep iterating, pop once you're done, you know, and run through this. So this backtracking example is actually then subclassed here. So here where we're actually creating the stack, and then this is the, um, what you call it, the array we're traversing. So here, this is a power example and a perm example. These two are actually using the backtracking to build up just the permutation. So permutations is, you know, an, a recursive call that keeps adding, adding new members. Um, you have to find each with these, and that's what's in the backtracking class. Basically, uh, push is just going to add this to the array. Stack's going to add this to stack. Yield stack if it's greater than or equal to um, your size. So this is actually a common stock requirement. We're going to see this in the bundler too. But basically, 
I know I'm done, or I think I have an answer, if that array is of size n, because that's when you filled it up. So you know the conditions on the boundaries are not uh, terribly difficult. And so here, this is just creating permutations by check by pruning things that are already on the stack. And then the queen class is just going to call super to prune. So you know if it's already on there, don't do it. And then if you remember from our exhaustive search, this looks a lot like our diagonal check. So basically what we've done is we've snuck our diagonal check into the recursion. And that's what's going to prevent it from looking um, at all, you know, 10 factorial, n factorial um, examples. And so let's quickly uh, convince ourselves that this is, uh, this is faster. Good placement on these, right? And then the two that are sticking. To <laughs> All right. So Ruby, back to the uh, uh. Cool. So it does 10, 20. Nope. Oh. That's about to all right, so remember 15 took 600 minutes before. That'll take a few seconds. But backtracking itself is not perfect because this too is actually going to peter out. Um, it doesn't buy us as much space as we think. So then I started kind of looking, looking back at the bundle there. Bundle. Um, Bundler. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So that technique, however, um, is really important because that that is the, the the technique of sneaking in. So basically, what you have what you have is you have more and different search algorithms um, that work. But first, let's let's see backtracking in action. Um, this is a quick animation. Just about four seconds. So I'll skip it once we get a little farther. But basically, you see here it's adding queens and then pulling them off once there's some sort of problem, keeping the queens it has in place. And so this is kind of an animation of the depth first search. So I was like, cool, let's take, um, oh, all right. So basically this is gonna stop once it's found a solution. So to bring this back into the bundler world, the gem file is your constraint. So the gem file is saying, I need n queens on the board that can't attack each other, and the lock is the actual result. The lock is your either your array of you know, answers there or your, your board representation. Um, and you know, after seeing Greg Pollock's talk, I was like, and it uses depth first search and backtracking. So I went and I made myself a little animation. And the first thing I noticed actually is that this isn't depth first search, right? It, it, it kind of went breadth first. Um, and this was too small to have a problem with the resolve. Um, but this is exactly what it did. There's a flag that you'll find if you're jumping through the bundler source. It's called uh, all caps debug underscore resolver. Set that to anything before you run this and it'll start spitting out what the resolver is doing. Um, so like I said, that wasn't depth first. Um, so let's, let's, let's see what's actually happening. So remember, right, we're, we're doing recursion. Oh, hey, someone got this commit in. Nice, so that's Terrence, one of our local Austin on Railsers, and uh, a committer to the bundler. Uh, okay. He did that while he was in the meeting here, 31 yes. minutes ago? Yes, <laughs> yeah, this was indirect before, uh, before Terrence got in there. So, so hopefully it's still the same line. Did you break it, man? No. No, one, no one's touched this in a while. Um, all right, resolver. So here we go. So here, so there's a resolve method, right? And here, this is why we're not doing depth first search, right here. Sort dependencies, so the ones that are easiest to resolve are first. Easiest to resolve is defined by, is the gem already activated, do the version requirements, uh, blah, 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 blah. Basically, this is now driving our search. So before, where we had um, kind of a recursive thing that was just adding the next element on, this is actually saying, don't do depth first, don't do breadth first, 
This is what's known as best first search, if you want to give it a technical term. But really, because, and that has to do with the fact that it's using its own custom sorting algorithm to pull off the next um, requirement to resolve from the stack. I didn't need to do that. I just wanted to show off comp is and then plugins. I just clicked on it, didn't I? And I didn't need to do that again, did I? Yep. And <laughs> ignore that. Cool. All right, so that, like I said, that was the best, best first search, and then this is the definition of best first search. And this is one of my only really cluttered slides. Um, but basically, you're using a heuristic function, which, um, and really here, right, any extra knowledge about the problem domain, that's how you get faster. It's hard to solve these things in the abstract. It's extremely hard to solve these things in the abstract. As a matter of fact, you know, backtracking and some other way, you know, there are other search algorithms, but um, nothing beats uh, domain knowledge. And then, la and I also mentioned it wasn't doing, um, so we didn't get to force it to kind of backtrack, but you can take my word that it's not actually doing backtracking, it's doing back jumping. And the difference between backtracking is that when you hit a problem, you recurse every node of the tree, whereas in back jumping, you can make these big jumps um, to other parts of the tree. And you actually don't have to take my word for it because this is where um, I think kind of one of the most interesting parts of the way Bundler is implemented. It does the back jumping with catch and throw. Um, so th the resolution actually happens before you remember there were functions called success um, that were checking stuff. This is actually catching success and that's how it's going to finish the resolve. So that means Success is going to get thrown somewhere else, um, and I'll show that in a second. But so this is basically the mechanism that um, the recursion uses to store where it is on the stack. So we're just going to go through here. So there's um, so there's catch requirement dot name. So that's so if you see requirement dot name, so that's actually how it's going to know where to save. There's going to be a corresponding throw. Uh, statement for well, there's our throw success. So let's look at um, this throw success. Like I said, if requirements not empty, so this is going to say if there's no more requirements to add on to the stack, what are you doing? You're done. So so throw success and our resolve. Um, and then here's where you're throwing the gem name uh, to do the back jumping. Cool. So. So in essence, that's why that catch was in there in the original graphic you displayed earlier. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's, that's what this catch is. So this is just the idea of using throw and catch to do that, right? So it's going to be down at the bottom of the tree. It's going to say, holy crap, I've got no more wrecks left. Success. Whereas in backtracking, it's, it's actually going to go back up the tree. So it saves you from looking at this one node out of um, five or six, seven, one out of seven, um, you know, may not be a huge savings, but one seventh of three million uh, might start adding up. So to recap, we've learned about the gem file and gemfile.lock. We've learned about the command line interface. We've seen setup and require do their thing. Um, and we learned a lot about the resolver. We've also learned some stuff about search. Uh, these slides are up at Heroku. I wanted to serve this from Heroku, but it was having problems. Remember these guys. Think of these guys when you use the bundler. And uh, yeah, be happy. So that's it. Any questions? Er. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for coming to Austin Rails, uh, as we said.